What's up guys, welcome back to the continued deluge of tech announcements here in September 2022. Intel just finished broadcasting their innovation event where they had a keynote with Pat Gelsinger and they made some big announcements. So let's start with the big announcements. For starters, here are the Intel 13th Gen Core processors that will be launching on October 20th. They are codenamed Raptor Lake and we have the i9-13900K for $589, the 13700K for $409, and the 13600K for $319. Those are tray prices. And in fact, these CPUs are already up for pre-sale over on Newegg where they're priced a little bit higher than that, actually up to $660 for the flagship 13900K. Of course, we were also expecting slash hoping that there would be an announcement for Intel's Arc GPUs as well, and there was. We now have a launch date for the Intel Arc A770 GPU. It's coming out October 12th, starting at $329 US dollars. We didn't hear anything about the Arc A750 or the Arc A580, but it is good to know that Intel is actually launching the Arc A770 very soon, and the price seems pretty competitive at $329. There was a lot discussed during the keynote, some of it more interesting, some of it less interesting, but we're gonna go into some of those details right after this. Excellent. Today's video is brought to you by the Corsair HS65 surround wired gaming headset powered by custom tuned 50 millimeter neodymium drivers and featuring a microfiber headband and leatherette memory foam ear pads available in carbon or white. Connect to a desktop, laptop or console via the 3.5 inch jack or included USB adapter. Easily access the on-ear volume roller and flip to mute omnidirectional mic and use Corsair's IQ software to customize personal audio settings or enable Dolby 7.1 surround sound. For further details on the Corsair their HS65 headset, click the sponsor link in the video description. So let's get into some of the details that have been revealed or confirmed for Raptor Lake, starting off with the product stack, and here's a nice list of them over on Ars Technica. The Core i9-13900K is the flagship, and for each of these, there's the non-F-SKU and the F-SKU, and there's a $25 price difference between them. Again, note that these are tray prices, which means these are the prices that Intel sells to their customers who buy in lots of 1,000. So by the time they get to retail, they're going to be marked up somewhat. And we can see that Newegg is currently marking up the 13900K to six. $160. That's about a $70 premium over the tray pricing. But uh, beyond that, the specs for the 13900K and KF are that we have eight P cores with 16 threads and then 16 more E cores with 16 more threads for 32 threads total. And we have some nice clock speed boosts going up to 5.8 gigahertz on the P cores in terms of turbo boosting. And Intel even said they're gonna be launching a six gigahertz frequency CPU, which will likely be a 13900KS, but that's not out right now. That's coming early next year. Beyond that, on this chart, we can see the base and max power for our power limit one and power limit two durations, 125 and 253 watts. And this has increased a bit from the previous generation, going from 341 to 253. A more significant jump on the 13700K going from 190 watts up to 253. And then likewise, the 13600K is up to 181 watts uh, versus 150 with the 12600K. Prices are also up a bit compared to last generation and that was expected. Intel announced early on that they were going to be increasing their prices a bit. Of course, the real question is once there are reviews up on these CPUs, how's the price to performance going to stack up against AMD's Ryzen 7000 series? Now, just to run down some additional stats and info about the platform, 13th gen Raptor Lake CPUs will still use the same LGA 1700 package and socket as a previous gen Alder Lake, so they are backwards compatible with 600 series chipset motherboards, although a BIOS update might be required. And that's a significant point for anyone who might be looking for a budget option, especially if you're looking at some of the prices for the Ryzen 7000 series CPUs and the platform costs when it comes to the motherboard prices and DDR5 prices, you still have DDR4 motherboards that will work with Raptor Lake CPUs that could potentially provide a better bang for your buck in terms of upfront costs. But we also have intercompatibility with the new 700 series chipset motherboards. Those will also support the older Alder Lake processors. Generally speaking, Intel's claiming a 15% single threaded performance improvement for this generation over last generation. And then of course, up to 5.8 gigahertz frequency on the P cores for flagship chips like the 13900K. And then we also have that new peak frequency going all the way up to 5.8 8 gigahertz on the P cores. And the E cores are also getting about a 400 megahertz boost going up to 4.3 gigahertz versus 3.9. Combine those IPC improvements with the frequency improvements and Intel says it results in a 41% multi-threaded performance uplift versus the 12th gen. And they say the 13900K outperforms the Ryzen 9 5950X in multi-threaded performance as well as the Ryzen 7 5800X 3D in gaming performance. But we still need to see how that stacks up against like the 7950X, but that has been out for like less than 24 hours. 
All told, CEO Pat Gelsinger says the 13th gen core processors are gonna provide the best gaming, streaming, and recording experience ever, as well as the world's best overclocking experience. And they have mentioned hitting DDR5 speeds on this platform up to 10,000 mega transfers per second, as well as Raptor Lake P-Core overclocking to eight gigahertz with exotic cooling. For anyone specifically interested in gaming performance with these new chips, Intel did provide some charts. These are directly from Intel, so do take them with a grain of salt. But this chart shows 13900K uplift versus the 12900K, and it's going anywhere from zero all the way to maybe close to 20% with uh, League of Legends at the top there. And then they also showed a comparison here versus the 5950X in orange across a bunch of titles, as well as the 5800X 3D, which is this extra little red line that they put up there because obviously that would make them look worse if they made this into a full bar. But even though the 5800X 3D can regularly outperform the 12900K, if you're looking at the darker blue bar here, that's supposed to be the 13900K, and they're saying that that does outperform the 5800X 3D, at least in most of the titles. Maybe not in World of Warcraft or Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord. But of course, again, we should wait for independent reviews to verify and validate some of this information. But just to round out some of the stats here, the new CPUs will still be manufactured on the Intel 7 node, which is actually a 10 nanometer enhanced super fin to be specific. Although they are calling this third generation Intel 7, which likely refers to some of the refinements that they've made to help eke some more performance out of that process. And then there are quite a few more refinements under the hood that uh, the articles I will link in the description get into a bit more detail on, such as the newly designed Raptor Cove performance cores. Those are upgraded or updated from the Golden Cove performance cores with Alder Lake. They now have more dedicated L2 cache, two megabytes per core versus 1.25 megabytes per core with the previous gen. And then things like the Uncore or the Ring Bus interconnect frequency now boosts up to five gigahertz, 900 megahertz faster than Alder Lake. Switching back over to the Arc GPU coverage, it was fairly limited in terms of the amount of time they spent discussing it. They have confirmed that uh, launch date available on October 12th and that starting price of $329, which is pretty competitive in terms of mid-range offerings that are on the GPU market right now, and actually a decent amount less than some rumors were speculating the ARC A770 might actually cost. I will say I appreciate how Intel positioned this card. After getting into GPUs at first, they started talking about data center GPUs, their Flex Series 140 and 170 cards that have hardware-based AV1 encoders for the data center for the first time. A little bit about Ponte Vecchio, Pon Ponte Vecchio data center GPUs as well that Pat was holding up, so that was cool. But then to segue into the ARC announcement, they talked about current GPU pricing and they put a little chart up showing how much GPU prices have increased just in the past year or so. And that has been a big issue recently, so I do appreciate appreciate Intel saying, hey, the mid-range needs more GPU options, and if the A770 is performance competitive with cards that cost around $300 to $350, then another entrant there is definitely going to be appreciated. We just really hope they can get the display driver situation sorted out, because that's certainly been an Achilles heel for the existing ARC A380 that's already launched. Not too much to say on the ARC A770 beyond that. They did show a little bit of a sizzle reel showing off some ray tracing and XESS support that's supposed to provide roughly double the amount of frames similar to the way that DLSS or AMD's Fidelity FX Super Resolution works. So it will be interesting to try that technology out as well and see how it performs versus the competition. Now, I also wanted to make some general notes in terms of the keynote presentation, and I still think that Intel hasn't quite figured out how to grab the audience, lead with the headliners, lead with the substantive information that people are really waiting to hear about before they dive into other stuff like AI and things that are just a little bit more nebulous and hard to grasp for your average at-home viewer. That said, this event is supposed to be addressing developers, so their approach does make some sense in that regard. Other random things, Pat wore an ASCII shirt with uh, some 8-bit code on it. It spells geek for anyone who was trying to figure that out. He pointed that out too. They framed the presentation as like playing games, these developer challenge games that they went along and solved. And then there was like a chime that played after they succeeded in each one, like you were playing a video game or something. And we can call this one complete in our challenge. Okay. Right. <laughs> and that really didn't resonate with me. It felt a little forced, like they were just trying to make it seem like more of a gamer-focused event. There was an awkward moment during the Unreal Engine demo when their input keyboard didn't work for the demo they were trying to set up. Uh, sorry, my keyboard is not working. Yep, my keyboard is not working, unfortunately, so I can't tap to... Oh but they turned that around a couple minutes later by showing off the actual demo for the game, which is called Nightingale, which looked uh, kind of creepy, but 
also pretty cool. They brought Samsung out to show off a rolling OLED display that uh, switches from 13 inch and then you can slide it out or roll it out to expand it to a 17 inch OLED display. This is actually something that I called many years ago. I said, phones at some point with rolling LEDs, you're just gonna be able to go and make them wider or shrink them back down to make them smaller. Right now they're doing folding stuff, but I thought it was cool that they actually implemented my idea. There was another cool demo with a detachable optical connector. Their, their goal here is a high bandwidth, low power connectivity with a plug that can plug in and unplug, similar to like USB, but actually using a silicon photonics chip that uses photons for the communication. That one is obviously still in development, but they got their Israel team to come out and uh, the plugging and unplugging actually worked, so that was good. Linus Torvald showed up for a little bit, so that was fun too. Uh, and then uh, Chipotle was involved and they were showing uh, small form factor edge devices that they're implementing in Chipotle stores to monitor the food in Chipotle restaurants that they're using to prepare burritos and stuff for people. I thought this was kind of interesting as a practical use case, but then I was also like, why is Intel making burritos right now? I'm not sure if that makes sense. It's almost lunchtime though and I'm getting hungry, so let's proceed to our final topic, and that is motherboards. Since we have a new lineup of Raptor Lake CPUs, we of course have Z790 motherboards now. So Asus now has a landing page up with uh, motherboards such as the new Z790 Maximus Extreme from their ROG lineup. Here's a Z790 Hero as well that will hopefully not be ridiculously expensive. And I thought this was a prime motherboard since it's got white accents, but this is actually from their ROG Strix line, the ROG Strix Z790-A gaming Wi-Fi. Ooh, and Mini ITX Z790-I gaming Wi-Fi right there with, uh, again, just a ridiculous amount of stuff wedged onto a Mini ITX board. EVGA also, they're not dead. Even though they're not making GPUs anymore, they're still making motherboards and they now have the Z790 dark board right here, which you can see is made for overclocking because of all this overclocking stuff here and the fact that they have a rotated socket with two dim slots that are positioned as close to the socket as possible. And it looks like they'll have the Z790 Dark Kingpin as well as the Z790 Classified. MSI posted a press release with a bunch of their boards as well with stuff like an exploded shot of their VRM cooling solution. They have their Pro Series, which tends to be a little bit more practical and not quite as much aimed at gamers. They have the Z790 Tomahawk. Their Tomahawk boards tend to be good options more towards the budget range, but I feel like they've become more expensive since they've gained popularity. Here's their MPG lineup, which is sort of the middle of the road gaming experience without quite as much bling or expense as the MEG lineup. And they have some silver options here as well as a mini ITX board. Then here are the MEG boards, the uh, Ace here on the left and the Godlike here on the right, which looks like they added an extra motherboard to it. This is clearly beyond even EATX. This is, this is an extremely wide motherboard as you can hopefully tell over here. Like what is this panel right here even doing or covering? Is there an M.2 slot under there? What's going on? I don't know but you know, hopefully we'll find out more soon. And then we also have a Gigabyte Z790 series, which has this picture here with all of them either, are they frozen or are they being electrocuted? I'm not sure, maybe it's frozen electricity, but here is the Z790 Aorus Master, the Z790 Aorus Elite AX DDR4 edition. So this one might be a good budget option. And the Z790 Aero G, which uh, has pretty cool, distinct looking design elements there with the, with the sort of white and almost like retro futuristic, I'd say design for that one. So there's a quick sampling of some of the motherboards that should likely be available by October 20th, the same day that the Intel Raptor Lake 13th gen core CPUs launch, which I guess means I have even more benchmarking ahead of me, hooray. But that's all the time I have for this video you guys so thank you so much for watching if you enjoyed it hit the thumbs up button and you can check the uh, description down below for links to some of the articles i talked about today as well as some of the specific hardware if you'd like to help support my channel you can visit my store at paulshardware.net where you can buy shirts mugs pint glasses and all manner of high quality merchandise and of course if you're not already subscribed to my youtube channel consider doing that as well so you can be notified when i post new videos thanks again for watching this one you guys and we'll see you all next time